Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, mighty God. We give you praise and glory, Lord. Thank you, God. Oh, Lord, we give you praise. Hallelujah, Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for strength and power, Lord. Thank you, God, that you're meeting with us, Lord. You're meeting with us, Lord. We believe it with all our hearts. Lord, we're not going to be the same when we leave, Lord. We're going to have grown in the grace and knowledge of our Christ. And Father, we thank you for this with all our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, thank you, Lord. Thank you. you may be seated. What a privilege, uh, Brother Clendenin, to be back here again and uh, to share this incredible time with you and to sense the hunger for the Lord in so many. It's so good to see spiritual hunger in America today. I thank God for this with everything that's in my heart. I, Brother Clendenin has just been in New York City where he uh, preached on a Sunday and a Tuesday. And what an incredible touch of God came into the church. When uh, service was finished on one Tuesday night, we just stood in, immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how else to say it. With about maybe 40, 50 minutes, you just stood there. And when you raised your hands, it, was like, it felt like you're putting your hands into oil. I, I can't quite describe what God was doing. And uh, the Lord... Uh, set free, people were set free, saved, and uh, we're experiencing that now on a fairly regular basis. God is moving in incredible power, and we thank the Lord for this. He's put a series of messages on my heart, and it's uh, called The Corinthian Problem, The Roots and Resolutions to Powerlessness in the Last Days Church. This is a series that I'm preaching in New York City right now. i am finished three of those messages. Yesterday, I was just went outside and sat outside for a couple of hours and just prayed, and the Holy Spirit came very powerfully to meet me and gave me the fourth message for this series called uh, From a Captive to a Captain about the life of Paul. And uh, that's going to be, if you don't kick me out and you know, leave and get tired of hear, listening to me, on the last morning I'm going to be speaking that and, and telling you, you're going to go out of here with a shout. It's going to be something get into your heart. I know it. I've I almost feel, Pastor, just like skipping everything and just going right to the, it's almost like you, you have a really good meal and you want to just get to the dessert table and skip everything. And, but uh, we need a balanced diet before we get to the dessert table. Praise God. Uh, I, I feel the Lord's given me something for you this morning. Before I even get into this message, I want to share it with you. And, you know, when we meet with the Lord, and uh, we get together and we cry out, say, Holy Spirit, come and meet with us. And every one of us have a perspective of what that's going to be like. What, what's going to happen when God comes? Some people expect that he's going to be exposing all of our failings, and others expect that he's going to gloss everything over. And there, there are different expectations based on our own appreciation and understanding of God. And just in the, while John was still alive, we're talking about a first-generation church, in the book of the Revelation, where Jesus Christ came to this first generation church. And he called it the church because as he addressed each one of the seven, he said to the angel of the church. So he himself called it the church in spite of its condition. And um, I think of all of the different ways that he manifested his life and glory and what it meant to each of these congregations. For example, to Ephesus, this is a church that had fallen so in love with the work that they were falling out of love with the Savior. And it was such a deadly moment for them that when Jesus came, he said, no, I've got to set this straight because if you don't, if you don't, if you don't get this, you're going to lose your testimony. You're going to lose it all. The, the very candlestick is this life of Christ within you. You're going to lose that. And you think of, about the church of Sardis. Now, Sardis is a church that just had it all together. Sardis knew how to do things. They probably had access to more talent than most uh, churches, and they, they just learned how to pull all the levers and to do everything. As a matter of fact, they did it so well, they didn't need the Holy Spirit any longer. And <clears throat> Jesus came to Sardis, and he said, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. And the word in the Greek is nekros, and it means that you're cut off from the enlivening influence of the Holy Spirit. That means you, 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 you have a reputation, but the discerning eye coming in sees that, that, that what you're doing is not dependent on, birthed in, or carried by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you go to Laodicea, for example, 
and uh, in Laodicea, this is a type of a church that's got a nice building. They've uh, got the, the program is all in order. Everything looks good in the community. And they stand outside and said, ah, oh, this is just wonderful. We've got everything we need now. We're just going to hold on to this until the Lord comes. And the Lord says, oh, no, you've lost so much. You have no idea what you've lost. There's, there's a vision that you should have that's gone and a heart that you should possess that, that long ago left you. And then I think about Philadelphia, and that's where I'm coming to now. I have felt this in prayer. There's so many that are here that you could say, that's me. Now, Philadelphia is a church. That their testimony is you have a little strength. You've not denied his name, and you've kept his word. And I, I do feel that's many of come in. This is an awfully hard generation to stand in. They're, everything is against the testimony now in the life of Christ. And many pastors, you're struggling and plowing, and you're surrounded by this, this debauched world that seems to be swirling all around your head in this generation. And you come in, and, and it's, it's, it's as if you're saying, Lord, you, I'm so little. I, I've done everything I know to do. And I just don't know how. If you're going to ask any more of me, I don't know how I'm going to give it. I'm coming anyway, but I don't have hardly any strength left to even stand where I'm standing, let alone to progress and go and do any more. And it was to this church that the Lord came and said, I know you only have a little strength, but he said, I'm setting before you an open door. And it's a key. It's the key of David opens. It's, 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 it's the key of Christ and Christ's victory. And I'm, I'm opening this door that no man can close to you. Yeah. And he says, I'm going to take you through this door. Yeah. And I'm going to do such a work in you that I'm going to make those who are all that live in religious fakery, I'm going to make them to bend their knee and to know that I've loved you. I'm going to take you in your littleness of strength. And that's the word to you today. Many who have come here, and you're, you're, you're crying tears, but some of it is for the lost, but a lot of it is for yourself and your own condition. The sense of smallness. The worst mistake you could make today <clears throat> is to look God in the face and say, can the Lord provide a table in this wilderness? Well, I want to tell you he can provide a table in the wilderness. He can give you what you need, and he's going to take you through a door. I'm prophesying, I guess, for lack of a better word, but within three days, you're going to know something. You're going to receive something of God. You're going to go through this door. Praise God. And you're going to have a strength that you've been longing for. Now, to get there, we've got to go on a journey. We all, especially Pentecostals, we like to start from scratch and be in victory in about five minutes or less. But it doesn't work that way. If you're going to build a building, you've got to sometimes re-examine the foundation. And we're going to ask the Lord to do what only he can do. I, I really don't want to waste your time or God's or mine. I don't want to speak anything that the Holy Spirit's not asking me to speak. I want to be a, a blessing and see you strengthened in God. And I believe in God with all my heart for that today, if you'll believe with me. Oh, Father, I pray God with all my heart for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I don't come to you in strength. I don't come to you knowing it all. I come to you in weakness, Lord. I come to you as Paul stood before the people in weakness and trembling. And I acknowledge before these people and before heaven that I only stand by the strength of God. I pray, God, come upon me. Come upon this audience, Lord. Lord, lift us out of every trap of the enemy. Lift us out of all self-focus. Lift us, God, out of everything that would be sent to destroy the testimony of Christ and bring us into something of Jesus' life. Oh, Lord God, if you don't give life, we have no life. If you don't walk in us, we have no testimony. It's all about you. It has been about you from the beginning. You came to us in our nothingness and cleansed us. You've empowered us, O oh God. Help us, Lord. Help us to see these things again. Help us to go back, O oh God, if we've lost something in our vision, Lord. God, I praise you with all my heart. I thank you, God, for what you're going to do in this room. Lord, there is going to be something of glory come into this room. I thank you for it, God. You're going to strengthen this church. You're going to strengthen this testimony, oh God. You're going to set an open door, and the weakest of the weak are going to get up and walk through it, Lord. There's going to be something of God's glory released in the people, in the churches, Lord. We believe it. I know it in my heart. That's why, God, that's why there's been such opposition against this conference. That's why the enemy has feared this moment, oh God. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God. It's not by might nor by power. It's by your spirit, oh God, that we live. 
we move, we have our being in our Christ. Thank you, God. Oh, Lord, fill my inward heart, so oh God. Don't let anything come out of me that's not birthed in the Holy Ghost. Keep me from the flesh, Lord. Keep me from good ideas. Let me just follow this river of your life, oh God. Oh, Jesus, give drink to those that are thirsty, God. Give food to those that are hungry. Give strength to those that are weary. My God, my God, open prison doors, Lord, to those that have been so long behind a certain prison that they don't believe they can ever get out. I pray you open these doors and let there be freedom, God. Let there be freedom that nobody has to fake it, God. Nobody has to play a game. There'd be really life in Christ. I praise God for this with all my heart. Lord, I thank you for it. I give you the glory. Before we even go into the battle, I give you the glory because we're already more than conquerors through Christ. I thank you, God. I give you praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you'll go in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'd like to speak this morning on the church that loses its calling. The church that loses its calling. Now, um, I'm going to begin, and I finished off with Philadelphia, and I'm going to actually go back to it and then finish with it again at the end of this session this morning. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26. <clears throat> For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, and not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world. Praise God. To confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound things which are mighty. And base things of the world. And things which are despised as God chose them. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are you in Christ Jesus. Who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Now, folks, I just came back from Spain. Uh, Teresa and I were speaking at a pastor's conference there, and uh, it was a wonderful time. The Lord came, visited us. Thank God for that. But that wasn't the highlight of my trip to Spain. We, we saw many wonderful things. We saw historic things. And, of course, we saw the Lord move in, in incredible fashion. But the highlight of my trip is getting to the airport in Valencia, and I had about a th three-hour wait until Teresa flew in from England, and a young man met me at the airport, and his face looked familiar to me. And he said, Pastor, he said, I've, I've just so waited for this moment. He said, I've got to tell you what God's been doing in my life. So we sat in the airport for the next three hours, and we laughed and we cried. God so spoke to me. It was incredible. This man, his name is Cesar Gill, had been a pharmacist in uh, Colombia, lived his life to get out of <clears throat> South America and that part of the world to get to New York City, which, of course, so many people believe is the promised land, only to be really disappointed when you get there after a little while. And so he got here into New York City because his pharmaceutical degree didn't, uh, wasn't an equivalent in the States. He became a furniture salesman, started coming to the church, and started translating the messages in Times Square Church. And he'd be, our translation booth is really, really up high in the top of the theater. And uh, he was one of the translators translating into Spanish. And I, I remembered him because he came to me after a service one day. And he said, Pastor, he said, something very unusual is happening to me. He says, when you're speaking, the anointing comes on me. And he said, I, I, I stand up. And he says, my, I'm not translating anymore. I start to preach. And he said, I can't explain it to you other than to say, I'm preaching ahead of you, one line ahead of you, your whole message. And he says, I know exactly what you're going to say and where you're going to go. And he says, I can't, I, I'm so excited. He said, I, I, I just know where the message is, is going to go and what it is that you're going to say. Well, subsequently, we began intercessory prayer for the nations, and he uh, put a pin in Spain and began to, we had a prayer board in the uh, rotunda, and he began to pray for Spain, and the Holy Spirit put a burden on his heart to go to Spain. Now, he said, I, I don't know how to go to Spain. He's got no Bible training. He's only been translating for us for seven years. That's his whole school. That's everything he's learned is what he's translated. And so he says, well, I, if I'm to go, God's going to have to make a way. So he shared it with our missions director. I feel the Lord might be calling me to Spain, but I don't know how I'm going to do this. Within one week, just by word of mouth, he had a year's support come in. And he knew he was to go to Spain. Didn't, still didn't know what he was to do. So he got on a plane and headed over to Spain, went to the 
uh, overseer of uh, the major Pentecostal denomination there. He introduced himself. This is who I am. He said, and I've been sent here of the Lord. And he says, I'm, I'm here to serve whatever you want me to do. He says, I'll do it. And the man said to him, he said, well, one thing we don't have, he said, we've been looking through our whole denomination for anybody who would be willing to go into northern Africa, into the Islamic part, and to begin to work there. And he says, I'll go. And so he headed off into northern Africa. Three years ago, he now is a church of 140 people, almost all Islamists who have come to Christ. They speak three different languages. <laughs> he said to me, I still don't know what I'm doing. I just get up and I, I preach what God gives me, and I love the people, and I just keep <laughs> baptizing them as they come to Christ. <laughs> But before he picked me up at the airport, he said, I just baptized a police officer, a teacher, and a construction worker. And he says, they're so alive in God. And he said, I'm so happy. He said, I, I still don't have any, like he, he still doesn't have any support really, but the, the Lord just keeps providing for him. It's amazing to see the, the, the principle of the simplicity of Christ. The simplicity of Christ. This, as we heard earlier today, this, this, this man and woman who just simply chooses to obey God and says, Lord, this is what you've called me to do. Now, I'm not going to ask you how to get it done. I'm just like Brother Clendenin at 70 years of age. I'm just going to go out and do it because this is what God is speaking to my heart. Now, Paul knew that the Corinthian Christians were called to this incredible inheritance in Christ. But they were in danger because carnal thinking was still very prevalent in their midst. Their society was very much like ours today. At Corinth... There was a saying in Corinth that it was a very wealthy city, it was a very affluent city, it was a very sensual city or culture. And there was a saying that to live like a Corinthian means to live in wealth and to live in sensuality. Corinth had, at the height of the Roman Empire, 200,000 free people. They called them free men living in Corinth and about 500,000 slaves. The religion of Corinth, there was a temple and if you, look, if you saw the ruins of Corinth today, there's still, I believe, seven pillars of one of these temples standing in the highest place of what used to be the city. And in this temple, there were 1,000 prostitutes that uh, exercised the office of a, a priestess. And uh, prostitution was the religion as it is of Corinth. Amazing when you think of it that, that uh, fornication had become an act of worship in that society. And folks, don't even try to tell me that that's not going on in America today. We have recently, our, the governor of New York State was just brought down by a young prostitute, and now this young lady is in demand all over the country. She's going to be a star before you know it, a prostitute. Don't tell me we're not worshiping prostitution in this country. Well, and folks, their society was so self-focused, and that's the, the danger of a self-focused society. America, and I'm not, I'm not anti-American, please don't misunderstand me, but any society that begins to look within and have a care and concern only for itself and cast off the knowledge of God. Romans 1 says, because they didn't want to retain the knowledge of God in their mind, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. They took the image of God, and even in a lot of what has professed to be Pentecost in the last 15, 20 years, says they turned the image of God into an image of birds and four-footed beasts and unclean animals. It's, it's reprobation beloved. This is producing this kind of uh, idiocy that has masqueraded as revival. The society is much like ours. There was a lust for fame, money, and power, and advantage and position over other people. And the, the Corinthian church had never fully dealt with this. They, they'd never fully laid it down. And they had allowed, because of it, there was, it began with what appeared to be a, a simple problem. Now, now, Corinth was the most problematic church that Paul had to deal with. You know that he's made several, three, at least three journeys to Corinth, and he wrote letters to Corinth, and it was a, it was a difficult church. It, it was a church that Paul could have said, well, I've had enough of this church. I'm, I'm going to walk away from it. And I, after all, I've got Ephesus. I've got all these other churches that are more teachable. I'm going to walk away from Corinth. But he, as Christ will never walk away from his people. And folks, you and I must be careful. We, we can have knowledge. But we must never let the knowledge that we have of God cause us to walk away from his people. Paul showed this. This was a church that was in trouble. And sad to say that a church historian, after, long after the death of Paul, wrote, and it appears that the problems in Corinth still were in existence long after the death of Paul. Now, the church as a whole may not have turned, but there are individuals in Corinth that heard what Paul had to say 
and no doubt turned, and we can see that in the book of 2 Corinthians, and, and made a difference in their society. This church, had our society has a man focus. We're star focused. It's all about, you go to New York City, it's all about people. And sad to say, in our generation, we're, we're, we're elevating the most debauched elements of our society now are being elevated and, and, and put on pedestals as if these are role models for future generations. God help us as a church. We've got to rise again in the power of the Holy Spirit, folks. There is no other hope for this generation now. The future of this country and the Western world lays at the doorstep of, of, of the church of Jesus Christ, of you and I. There's no other place that God is looking to now. It's not coming through government. Thank God for good government, but good government will never bring revival. It has to come through the church of Jesus Christ. There's got to be an imparting of the Holy Spirit and the knowledge of God coming through the church. But Corinth never dealt with these things. Instead of focusing on Christ, they're still focusing on men. And that's one of the dilemmas of our modern day. The focus on man has, has opened the door to all kinds of foolishness in the house of God. It started out as a seemingly legitimate spiritual preference. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and says, I hear there's divisions among you, and I partly believe it, Paul said. Some of you say, well, I'm a Paul. I'm a, I like Paul's preaching. I, I like the way that he presents the gospel. And others were saying, no, we're of Apollos. Of course, Apollos, before he was instructed, was a man of the law. No, we, we like Apollos' preaching. And others would say, well, no, we're of Peter. You know, he's a meat and potatoes kind of guy. Just like get through the trial and God will be faithful. We like that kind of exhortation. And then others are saying, well, we're, we're of Christ, as if Christ is not in these other three. And Paul was saying, no, listen, you got it all wrong. When you start to focus on people, you're missing something. We are all given to you as a gift. You, you are the building, Paul said, that God is building. And, and we are just instruments in the hand of God. One of us plants, another one waters, but all the increase comes from God. It's the Holy Spirit that produces the increase. The increase does not come from the, the wisdom of man. And that's why Paul said, I'd rather just come to you in my own frailty. I'd rather come to you as bumbling and stumbling as I am, that, that your confidence would not be shifted from the anointing of the Holy Spirit to the wisdom of man. And folks, this is exactly what's happened in America. Oh, God, help us. I, was, I happened to see the other day a, a preacher that I'd never, I'd never seen before. He's got thousands in his church. And, and I, I listened to this for about 20 minutes, and I found myself shouting out, Oh, God, oh, God, look at these people sitting there, glassy-eyed, listening to the wisdom of men, absolute gibberish out of the human spirit, masquerading as the gospel of Jesus Christ. God help us to get our focus off of man. God, God help us to look away from man. Thank God for the offices in the church. Thank God for the pastors and prophets and apostles and all these teachers and such like. But that's not where our focus is to be. I'm not called to look like you. And you're not called to look like me. We're all called to look like Christ Jesus. We are called to look like him. And you see, the Corinthian church, that's how it all started. They had a man focus. And because they wouldn't deal with it, it opened the door to their house to all kinds of error. They, they wouldn't deal with the division that was among them, and it, it seemed just legitimate. And it, it's like if we went to the, a buffet after this service today and we stood and argued about, you know, one guy says, I like the lettuce, and somebody else likes the roast beef, and we all argued about which was better, when all are necessary for the growth of the human body. And folks, the Corinthians wouldn't deal with it. And because they wouldn't deal with it, they, the doors of their church opened to carnal and exploitive preachers. That, that's exactly how it happens. We, we wonder, we say, well, how do these men and women get into the church in the first place? It happens because we're looking at men and not looking at Christ. If we were looking at Christ, you'd spot them right away. You'd know a fraud. If, you're, if, if, if your focus in mind is on Christ... If, if he's the one that we want to look like, then somebody coming in, I don't care how shiny their teeth are and how fine their suits and shoes are, if, if Christ is not being born through that vessel, you would know it, and I would know it immediately. Paul said it this way, and he wasn't gentle about it, and I'm just going to read you these scriptures in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, verses 19 and 20. He said, you suffer fools gladly, seeing you're, you're wise. Paul said, you're so smart now. Corinthian church that you're letting fools into your pulpits. Absolute clowns are coming in. Oh, folks, major Pentecostal denominations now are having stand-up comedians in their conventions. 
You, you suffer fools. You're so smart now. You know how to do everything now. You've got a plan. You've got a 10-year plan for absolutely everything. You've got books on helps and steps and how to do this and how to do that. You're so smart now. You've got clowns in your pulpits. That's what Paul was saying to the Corinthian church. He said, you suffer or you allow if a man bring you into bondage. Remember what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2? They, 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 they preach liberty, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. Their hearts are completely intertwined with the things of this world. They never made a break with this world. And they come to those who are clean and escape from those who live in error. And they draw them right back into that very bondage that brought them away from God in the first place. He said, you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, if, if, he, if he slap your simplicity in Christ, just like the, the uh, councils did to Jesus Christ, the simplicity of the plan of God to standing before the, the governments of men as it is, both religious and secular at that time, and they couldn't handle the simplicity. They had to slap his face. And the simplicity of Christ is being slapped one more time, telling you that, you know, because you don't have such and such a degree or you're not this tall or you can't sing or you can't do that or you, you can't put together a clever argument that somehow you're on the outer fringes of the kingdom of God, that you and I are to just be uh, happy, just, just be happy. That's what they tried to tell David. Remember his brothers? Just go back to the few sheep in the wilderness. We know how to fight this battle. You see, we've been to the conventions and seminars on polishing armor. We know how to do this. All you got is a confidence in God and a stone and a sling in your hand. You go back. We know the naughtiness of your heart. No, 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 no. The receiving of carnal and exploited preachers was basically the downfall of Corinth. And because of this, and because we're, they were letting themselves be entertained by these people that Paul called fools in 1 Corinthians Chapter 3 and verse 1, they had an inability to receive and hear challenging and deepening truth. This is why I'm so happy this morning because I believe that you're not of this mold. You have a heart to hear truth. If I started preaching like this in some places, I'd be all by myself after a little while. Folks would just get up and walk out and say, we didn't come here to hear this. We came here to be told that we are apostles and prophets and that we're all going to be successful and rich and we're going to work miracles, and uh, we're going to be happy. There's going to be no struggles come our way. We'll never be, uh, go through a trial. And Paul said in chapter 3, verse 1, he said, Brethren, I could, not, I, I could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat. You're not able to bear it before, and, hither, and, and still you're not able to bear it. He, he says, you see, that this opening the door, puts away the ability to hear challenging and deepening truth, that truth that truly brings us into line with the character and the life of Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, the Corinthian church had developed a false spiritual identity. Listen to what Paul says. Now you're full. Now he's, he's being sarcastic. Now you're rich, and you've reigned as kings. You ever notice everybody's reigning now? Everybody's a prophet. Everybody's an apostle. Now you've reigned as kings without us. He said, I wish to God you did reign that we might also reign with you. Paul said, I wish you were reigning. It would be so nice because, you see, we are set last. We're appointed to death. We're made a spectacle. The world hates us. And we're fools for Christ's sake, but you've become so wise. We're weak, but you're strong. You're honorable, but we are despised. Even to this present hour, we find ourselves hungry, thirsty, naked, are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. We labor, working with our own hands. We are reviled, but we bless. We're persecuted. We suffered. We're defamed. We entreat. And we're made as the filth and offscouring of the world and all things to this day. He said, I write not these things to shame you, but I, as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have not many fathers. In Christ Jesus, I've begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. They had a false spiritual identity. I'm thinking of, I was hearing this message just a, a short while ago, this, this man standing before thousands and telling the people how great they are, how wonderful they are. No mention of sin. No mention of coming short of the glory of God. I'm talking about great and wonderful in themselves. I, I'm, the odd scripture thrown out, but always out of context. 
Oh, folks, oh, folks, that is false spiritual identity. And this is the crisis that's facing the church of America today, an identity that, is, that has Jesus' name but not the life of Christ in it. There's nothing of Christ in it but his name. Everything else is a facade. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. The Corinthian church has tolerated sinful practices in their midst. Listen to what Paul says. It's reported commonly that there's fornication among you, and such fornication is, is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And, you're not, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he has done this deed might be taken away from you. You see, the tolerance of sin comes from a social focus that is not a Christ focus. The Corinthians, could, they could look outside the windows of their little church, wherever it was, and, and see the temple on top of the hill with its thousand prostitutes and watch the stream of lust-laden men going in and putting down their money and committing fornication in the temple. And they could say, well, hey, at least we're better than they are. But folks, we're not called just to be better than the society around us. And this was the dilemma. You, we're called to be as Christ. We, we're called to walk with Christ. We're, we're called not to tolerate sin first in ourselves before we even deal with anybody else. We're called not to tolerate pride and ignorance and arrogance and everything else that was in that society. Then we, we get down to the baser things of, of the flesh that we we'll all have to trust God for victory over. In chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, Paul says, Brother goes to brother before unbelievers. There's utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Now, here, here, are, here are the Corinthian church were harboring grudges to the point where brother was taking brother to court over insignificant and trivial matters. Now, I'm not saying that the, the woman who's being beaten in her home should not use the law. Paul even used the judicial process in his own defense of Rome. There are times when, but the, the, Paul's talking about insignificant things that you should be able to, to settle among yourselves. He says, do you not know that you're going to judge angels? And, and you can't even find a man among you who's, willing, who's able to tell you what's right and what's wrong? And they were harboring this. And part of the casualness that can come into the church of Jesus Christ is that we can harbor grudges one against another and think there's no consequence. I venture a guess there's a hundred grudges in this room today. I venture a guess I'm not far off on that. People who have taken an offense, and we're not doing like the Corinthians, I guess, we're not going to court over it, but in our hearts we're going to court. We've already uh, sensed the other person is guilty, and we're already hoping the executioner will show up in the not-too-distant future. And I guess worst of all, in, when you get down to chapter 11, <clears throat> the Corinthian Christians... Verses 21 and 22, it says, For in eating every one takes before another his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What, have you not houses to eat and drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? He said, I praise you not. And this is exactly where the church that loses its calling always goes. They push the poor and the disadvantaged and those who cannot help their agenda to the sides of the temple. And they push the poor out of their collective consciousness. A backslidden church has no heart for the poor. A backslidden church will never go into prisons like we heard today. A backslidden church cares nothing for the widow and nothing for the orphan and nothing for the poor man laying in the street because they can't do anything to promote the agenda. They don't want them in the church because they want to look successful as the society is around them. Society has rejected them. But thanks be to God that Christ hasn't. And he has a church that has not rejected them. He is a church that is, has open hearts and open arms for the poor of this world. I thank God for this, the highlight of my life. I was in Burundi last July, had the opportunity to speak on television and radio for three nights live to Burundi, to Rwanda, to Tanzania, and the Congo, on this, dealt with the spirit of murder and preached on reconciliation. And that was wonderful. I saw the president sing before God. I saw the vice president dance. I saw God. I saw 30,000 people so full of joy in a field because they had made the choice to reconcile before God. I praise God for this with all my heart. But that was not the highlight of my trip. The highlight of my trip was taking two goats up a mountainside to a little old lady who was a Christian who had brought Christ into this village. 
a village so poor that all they had were rags to dress in. And I was there, and we brought a truckload of goats and chickens for the people of this village. It would be the first ever sustenance, the opportunity they had to have some kind of an industry. And I would take one of the goats as they handed them down from the truck, and I'd run up the mountainside. I was having so much fun. That one of my elders came to me and said, Pastor, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I must insist that you stop doing this. He said, you're going to have no strength left to preach the gospel. And I remember saying, I really don't care. This is the gospel. This is the gospel in its purest form. It, it doesn't get any clearer. It doesn't get any cleaner than this. If, if I lost my voice, if I, if I lost and I could never preach again, I would do this. I'd be more than fulfilled. And just seeing somebody's prayer answered, they, this little village was so poor. I've never seen poverty like this in my entire life. They had no clothing. They had, they had nothing. The, the, the graveyard it was almost as big as the village. They, they were dying like flies because they don't even have clean water. And I remember... They were standing there, and they'd all come to Christ. And they were clapping their hands, and for 20 minutes they sang this song of praise. And all, all the team that were with us started weeping. We didn't understand the song, but there was such a glory of God that came down in that little mud site mountain village. The glory of God came down there. We sat in this, under this little piece of straw on logs, and we cried. We all cried. We couldn't stop crying. We didn't know... Because God's glory was there. I leaned over to the translator. I said, what are they singing? They weren't singing for us. They weren't even looking at us. They were looking to heaven. And they're singing this song, children dressed in rags, young men and old. Do you know what their song was? They're singing in Kurundi. Only God could do this. Only God could do this. We asked him to help us and help us come. Only God could do this. Praise God. Now, the prophet Jonah is a textbook case of what happens when someone knows what God is saying and doesn't want to follow where his voice is leading. <clears throat> Jonah in chapter 1, he says, The word of the Lord came to him, and God said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it with them that go unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah heard a, wor a word from God. And if you're honest here today, God will speak to your heart. He will speak to mine. He will speak to yours. No matter where we've settled in, if, we're, if we've settled in in Ephesus, if we've settled in in Sardis, if we've settled in in Philadelphia, no matter where we're settled in, the Holy Spirit has something to say. There's something I was born to do for God. There's something you were born to do for God. You, he had this in his mind even before the foundation of the world. It was a specific work that only you can do and only I can do. And Jonah, his time came to go. And he didn't want to go. Jonah, in his heart, I don't like these people. I don't like this. He didn't like the Assyrian society. He didn't like their culture. He didn't like what they did. He didn't like how they treated other people. I'm just not going. And in his heart, he was afraid that God was going to be merciful. And he didn't want to go because these were avowed enemies of Israel. And so the scripture says he, he got on a ship and he paid the fare. Oh, folks, there's always a price, you know. There's always a price to pay when you go in the opposite direction to where God is calling you. And he says in the scripture, he joins others that are going to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And all these people think that they're on such a smooth journey today. All these thousands gathering in Christ's name thinking, oh, this, what a great journey this is going to be, not realizing there's a great price they're about to pay for this spiritual casualness. When the storm comes, there's going to be no resource to face it. And folks, I'm going to tell you there's a storm coming to this society. There's a terrible storm coming to all of us in the very, very near future. And the best thing you can do, as <clears throat> Scripture says, is start giving to the poor. The Scripture says you lend to the Lord and God will repay you. He says, when you give to those that don't have a helper, he says, when you cry out to me, if you've heard their cry, I'll hear your cry. You provided for them, I'll provide for you. Praise God, the best way to build up an insurance against the future if our whole economy collapses is start giving to the man. If you've got two loaves of bread, give one to the man that doesn't have any. Praise be to God. When I was a young Christian, Pastor, I was in, only saved a, 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 a few months. I'm in this church, and I'm devouring my Bible, I, and they're a very affluent church that I got saved in. I'm devouring the Word of God. I love the Word of God. Every day I'm just in this book and soaking it in. And I remember 
it was a cold February month in Canada, and it was probably minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And after the church service, they came downstairs, and uh, I, I'm, I'm the poorest guy, I think, in that church at that time. I've got a sheep farm out in the country. I'm just a young police officer, and I've, I've, I'm, I don't have much. And this, they come downstairs, and, and this man said, there's a man at the church door, and he has no coat. And so everybody there says, well, we'll pray about it. I remember, I remember them. The men are getting their coats, and they're saying, we'll pray about it. We'll pray about it. And this guy's saying he has no coat. There's a guy upstairs no coat. We'll pray about it. We'll pray about it. We'll pray about it. And I remember I just read in the Bible that week where, remember, they came to John and said, what, what should we do? And he says, well, let the man with two coats give one to the man that has none. Now, I was faced with an ethical dilemma because I had just bought a brand new coat. I had two coats. I brought my brand new one to church, and I've been saving for it for a long time. My old coat was at home. And the Lord says, give him your coat. There's, there's nothing to pray about. You've got two coats. I said, but Lord, my, my coat's at home. He said, not the home coat. You give him the coat on the hook. You give him the one you brought to the church. And folks, I've got to tell you, it was a turning point in my walk with God. Choosing to do what God speaks. It starts with the little things. So many people today want miracle ministries. They want to be evangelists. They want to travel the world. They want to tear down powers of darkness. They won't even give a poor man a coat who doesn't have one. That's where it all begins. It's in the, it's in the obedience to the little things. It's, it's the neighbor across the hallway. It's make, if, if all you've got is enough to make two sandwiches, then give one to the kid going to school that doesn't have one. That's where it starts, folks. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Thank God for the simplicity of Christ. These smart preachers today will slap your face for that simplicity. They don't want you giving to the poor. They want you giving to them, not to the poor. And folks, they'll slap the face of that simplicity. Jonah joins this church of another opinion. And it's, it's the type of a man who doctrinally shops until he finds a voice that doesn't confront his error and even praises him in his wayward focus. And there's so many today now that are, are looking to the church of a second or third or fourth opinion until they find somebody that agrees with their wayward idea of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But the Lord delivered Jonah. And I'm telling you that there's going to be a deliverance He's going to deliver the true believer. The false believer will not be delivered because they're not interested in the things of God. But the true believer is going to be delivered from the error of this generation. God is preparing a trial. The scripture says that the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Beloved, I'm telling you, there's a great collective trial coming to this whole society, perhaps the whole world. But maybe you're even already in one because God's moving you towards something that he had prepared for you. There is a trial coming, folks. There's a trial. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I'm not, you know, it sounds odd to, to people who don't know God. But I, I thank God for difficult times because it is going to cleanse the house of God. It's going to purify theology. It's going to be an instantaneous separation between the sheep and the goats. And all the game players are going to be running panic-stricken in the streets. Those who know God are going to be rejoicing. You're going to have a song of joy. You're going to go through a door in the littleness of your strength. The Lord says, I'm going to make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who have claimed to belong to God, but they don't. I'm going to make them to come and bow before your feet and to acknowledge that I have loved you. All praise be to God. Chapter 2, it says, the Lord, Jonah prayed to the Lord out of the fish's belly. He said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. I cried, he said, and you heard my voice. For you've cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about and in verse 3, he says, Thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Jonah had enough sense to know that this is the hand of God doing this. This is not the enemy prospering. This is God's hand. Then I said, I'm cast out of your sight, yet I'll look again towards your holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depths closed me in round about, and the weeds were wrapped around about my head. And I find that word so interesting because in the original Hebrew text, the word is weeds, but it also means it's also the word we use for the Red Sea. When the children of Israel went through the Red Sea, it's exactly the same word. And Jonah is saying it's the things that I thought would bring me to freedom when, when all along it was God and not my enemies pursuing me. 
I thought these things were going to make me fulfilled, but all they've done is bring me down into this incredible trial, into a place where I don't have the strength to get out. And it's God's mercy that will take his church into a place where she doesn't have the strength to get out in her own strength. There will be no book on the table anywhere that will tell you how to get out of this one. Folks, there will be no seven steps out of this one. He said, I went down to the bottom of the mountains and the earth with her bars was about me forever. Earth's reasoning, all the, all the things of this world, this society was about me and I realized all it had done is captivate me. And folks, there is a people that are going to be coming out of what we see as an apostate church in this generation. May I encourage you to be kind. May I encourage you, if they, if they do bow at your feet, may I encourage you to be kind like the father was to the prodigal son. May I encourage you to lift him up. May I encourage you to give them a garment and cover them in the blood of Christ. May I encourage you to empower them again and give them shoes and make them a co-laborer with Christ. God help us. God help us not to be like the older brother when this time comes. God help us to have open hearts and open arms to those that are coming home to him. He says, you brought up my life of corruption, O Lord, my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. My prayer came into you, into your holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I'll sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that, that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. Jonah says, God, when I came to you, I sang, where he leads me, I will follow. I said I would live for you. When you touched me, when you called me, I don't know when it was in his life. He said, Lord, I said I would. And now I'm going to. God, I'm going to live for you. And there's going to be a multitude of people in the coming days who make that claim, make those words a reality. And the moment he spoke it, it says, God spoke to the fish and it vomited out Jonah on the dry land. Praise God. If Jonah would have had a GPS, it would have said, what, is it, what do they say? Recalculating the route. You never get away from God if you're called of God. You never get away. You can take a long journey. Praise God. But, and you can waste years of your life, but you're going to hear that voice saying, recalculating the route. We're going to Nineveh. And you're going to cry out against that city. Now what foolishness. What foolishness in the sight of man. What, what a stupid plan, according to the smart preachers of our generation. This man come walking in a town of hundreds of thousands of people, steeped in their ignorance. The Lord says they don't even know their left hand from their right. Spiritually speaking, they're an absolutely ignorant people. And we see one more time God doing what God always does. If you can catch this, it can revolutionize your life. If it can keep you from getting too smart or too strong or too slick or too polished or knowing too much, all of a sudden God does what God has always done. Remember in Egypt... He said, now I need to bring three million people out of bondage. I need a plan. Oh, yes, here's a good plan. An 80-year-old man and his 83-year-old brother, and I'll put a stick in his hand and a one-line sermon, and that will be enough to get three million people out of bondage. That's all I will need to deliver three million people from one of the most powerful armies in the world. Praise God. Here comes the deliverer. You can see Moses walking down the highway. I think Pharaoh didn't kill him because initially he was just too perplexed. It makes no sense to the natural mind. It makes no sense to even be threatened by this old man and his stick and his one-line sermon that he just keeps saying, let my people go. That's all he would say. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The ways of God are foolishness to man. And the natural man cannot understand them because he lives in the state of his own thinking. He can't grasp spiritual things. He doesn't understand spiritual things. And I can just see now, Nineveh's all sewn up with the devil. Demons have people doing all the things that they have them doing. And people have perhaps... <clears throat> quite confident that have excluded God from all of their borders. And all of a sudden, coming past the city limits sign, can you see it? Welcome to Nineveh. Here comes this guy that spent three days in a whale's belly and running from God. He probably is a bit bleached. He's been, the acid in the whale's stomach would have bleached him. I don't think he was white or black. I think he was a shade of something we've never seen in this entire world. 
He comes walking into town. He most likely doesn't smell very good, doesn't look very good. He's not even, he's, he's even reluctant in measure to be where he is. But he walks into town, and everybody looks at this weak, independent, and seemingly foolish man who seems to be everything that a godless society doesn't want to be. Everything that the polished, smooth preachers tell the church that you shouldn't be and should live to escape, that's what he has become. That's what these people began to say about Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10. They said, we agree with you. His letters are weighty and powerful. But look at his bodily presence. is weak and his speech is contemptible. In other words, what they were saying, yeah, we agree this is the word of God. But, but you see, listen, we, we don't agree with what God says that this should produce or the kind of a man that it should make. We don't agree with it. No, we're supposed to be affluent. We're supposed to be smart and polished. We're supposed to have all the answers. We're supposed to be smooth and slick and the whole world's supposed to look at us and just fall back in awe. And here now comes Jonah into town. <laughs> Praise God. There's something different, though, about his man, this man. You see, in his littleness, in his nothingness, in his simple obedience to what God has told him to do, he has no plan. He doesn't know how this is going to happen. How am I going to win a city of 300,000 people to God? He doesn't even have any sermon notes. He's been three days in a whale's belly, lucky to have a shirt on his back, comes walking into town, and all of a sudden, I can see hell laughing at this man, and hell tries to laugh at the true church of Jesus Christ, and hell will laugh until he opens his mouth. Until he begins to speak, something is with him. Someone is with him. Something unseen. Something you can't see with the natural eye. He opens his mouth and hell begins to bend its knees. Prison doors start opening. Spiritually blind people start seeing. The bruised and wounded in heart start feeling a divine healing coming into their life. And everything of captivity has to release its captives. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Glory to be to God. Would be to God one more time in our generation, one more time in this generation, one more time in this generation, one more time the nobodies and the nothings and the weak and the maimed and the lame and the poor would stand up one more time and say, let God be God in me. Let God be God. Praise be to God. Paul says, we look beyond ourselves, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 12 and 13, and, and, we, and our own inabilities. We look beyond these things. I'm paraphrasing for Paul, but if you look it up, that's what he's saying. And it brought us to you. Paul's saying to the Corinthians, we were weak. We didn't have a plan. We didn't have it all together, but we had the living Christ within us. And in spite of our lack of ability, this living Christ brought us to you. We came to you not with wisdom of men's words, not with enticements, but we came to you in a demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. And you know, Paul said, that I was sent of God to you because the words I spoke were engraved by an invisible hand upon your heart. You're our epistles, Paul said. You are written and engraven by the hand of God. Something supernatural happened when you heard the Word of God spoken to you. Something that can't come from any of man's reasoning or plans or schemes. You can't figure this one out. It's supernatural. It comes from the hand of God. And you heard it. You felt it in your heart. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4 that we will live with him, that is Christ, by the power of God towards you. Paul said, here's the secret now. The power of God in us brought us to you. The power of God didn't bring us to success, that didn't bring us to living for ourselves. This was the Corinthian problem. The power of God didn't make us divided from the heart of God. No, we were gripped by God, and God in his power brought us to you. And if he had not brought us, you'd still be lost in your sins. This is what Paul is trying to say. And he's fighting against those that are challenging apostolic authority that was coming from God through the hand of Paul. Amazing. These preachers thought they were just standing against letters from a man, not realizing they were standing against the inspired text of the Scriptures. Praise God. Praise God. It seems that... I'm rediscovering this in my own life right now. One of the greatest battles you'll ever fight is success, or what men see as success. I, I'm, I'm not successful. I've inherited everything. 
that I have. And you're not successful either. You've inherited it all too. It was all won by somebody else, by somebody else, by somebody else until about 2,000 years ago. It was all won on a cross on Calvary. We were all recipients of another man's victory. The cry of my heart lately, more than ever before, or maybe back to the beginning, I'm not sure, is God help me to live my life for other people. Take me in my weakness deeper into your compassion. I want to care more. I want to know how you feel, Jesus. I, I want your heart. I don't want to walk by what I think or anything I've learned apart from this word. But I want to know. I want to know how you feel. Take me into your calling for my life. Whatever that is. Wherever it leads me. I want to go that way. Give me a single focus in life to glorify Christ and see men and women brought to salvation through him. Draw my heart out willingly for the needs of others. In other words, I'm asking to die that Christ may live. I'm asking to be nothing that he may be everything. I'm asking to be weak that he may be strong. And my prayer is that it would begin with those closest to me and end with those farthest from me. And for some here today, the, the beginning of this journey starts across the table in your own house. Marriages that are breaking down, selfishness and division in the house. Let's not talk about it in Corinth until we deal with it in the house. Division right at your own table and pride causing you not to make that four-foot journey to the other side of the table or the two-and-a-half-foot journey to the other side of the bed. And there's division there that has to be healed. And this is, this is where it begins. Remember I said you start by giving your coat. <laughs> this is where it all starts. It, it, it starts with those closest to me. It, it starts by reaching out to those, as Jonah did, that may have done things that have hurt. And then when we begin to obey in the first things, then those that are far away become a lot easier. I, I was brought on a journey a couple of years ago. I didn't understand this journey, but I was brought on a journey by the Holy Spirit of, of making right every, pa every wrong that I knew I could make right, of contacting people over the years that I had gotten into division with, even if I knew I was right and asking their forgiveness. No explanation. If I needed to let them, I, one man on the phone slapped me around for about 20 minutes, and the Lord said, let him do it. Let him get it out. Don't defend yourself. And then when he got it all out, then I said, can we work together now? And he said, yeah, I'd love to work together with you. I'd, I'd love to, that we could, and it just, it's just a matter of, of, of being on this journey of being reconciled until the point I, I felt I was reconciled to anybody and everybody in this world that I knew that might have an issue with me. And little did I know that I was being called into Burundi to speak to four countries about laying down generational grievances that have led them to murder, of speaking strong words to a nation, even to the government of the nation, about the ability and the willingness to empower a marginalized people and to give every man and every woman the ability to come back. There's, there was 160 or so thousand refugees listening on the radio in Tanzania from Rwanda and from Burundi. And folks, they listened. The president is a very humble man, a very true Christian man, and he instituted everything the Holy Spirit had spoken. Empowerment for the returning refugees, forgiveness, equal access to government, both tribes, the Tutsis and the Hutus, and the Twa. And uh, it just, this list goes on and on. But little did I know that this beginning journey was going to end at that journey. I didn't, you see, we don't always know. God doesn't give the whole plan. 
He just leads us step by step. Now, what if I was not willing to be reconciled? Tell me, what authority would I have had in a place where 300,000 people were slaughtered in a genocide and it spilled over into Rwanda and 800,000 in the same conflict really were killed in Rwanda? What authority would I have had in these meetings? And if you, I, I had to fight hell like I've never fought hell in my whole life. It took three months to recover when I returned. I'd wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. I would hear screams and explosions when nobody was screaming and nothing was exploding. It was absolutely demonic. I would have to pace my room and go over in my mind again why God had sent me and what, the, what it was. And the, the devil kept saying, you brought 200 people here and there's going to be an uprising. There would only been peace for three months in Burundi. And, you, they're all, and many are going to get killed and it's your fault. And I'd have to go back to what God had spoken to my heart. And so I guess the open door begins with obedience in the, in the first things that seem so insignificant sometimes, so small, but you, you don't know where they're leading to. It's, it's that first thing. It's that first step. And I guess that's what I close with this morning, the willingness to take the first step and just obey God. The, the Welsh revival, amazing. Evan Roberts was the young man in 1904, so greatly used in, in the revival. It's probably one of the greater the world's ever known. And... I was in that chapel where he preached in uh, Wales. And I, m- I remember the story of, of thousands of people, well, not thousands, about 2,000 that gathered to hear him at the height of the revival. And this, this, is, this is the man of God. And they gathered to hear him, and he would never speak unless the Holy Spirit spoke to him. And I remember the story is he, 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 he sat in his chair and would not get up for the longest time. And there was a silence and a stillness in the church. And <laughs> finally, he got up to the pulpit. And everybody's saying, oh, the man of God is here. He's going to open the word. We're going to hear from heaven. He got up to the pulpit, looked at the people, and he said, obey God. That's all he said. And they said, you had to see what happened next. People are returning things they stole, and confessions of sin are happening, and long-standing grievances are being settled. You see, they already knew what to do. There was nothing new that needed to be said. They knew. The Holy Spirit had already spoken. He said, we heard it this morning. Obey God. That's all he said is obey God. And so that's all I'm going to close with. Whatever the Holy Spirit. Now, whatever you're trying to put away is now right in the forefront of your mind. You can be sure of it right now. The Holy Spirit will bring it right to the forefront of your mind as I'm speaking. And because he wants you to put it away. Obey God. If it's a calling you've neglected, if it's, if it's a humility that God is calling for, if it's a simple thing of obedience, You don't know where it's going to lead to, but just obey God. I believe that marriages can be healed. This morning, I believe the way where children can come back to God. You're you're unlocking. When you obey God, you're unlocking heaven. You're, You're unlocking this presence of Christ to move so strongly, so powerfully. And that's why Paul was so crying out for the Corinthian church. Praise be to God. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day, this time together, the word that you're speaking. Oh, God. I pray with all my heart, Lord, you give us the courage to obey you. Give us the courage, Lord. We, we heard it this morning about obedience. Give us the courage to obey you, Lord. It's not complicated, and it may even look foolish. But I'd rather be foolish and living in the power of God. Lord, I, I pray, give us all the power to obey you, to, to simply do what you say. No questions asked. Just obey even the small things, Lord, just to do these things, Father. God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you that you have come for this time. You, you, you've gathered us for this season, for this, this, this appointment. This is an appointment with God in this conference. And there's been a witness that this will be one of the greatest ever. It will be, Lord, because you're going to grip the hearts of your people. Father, I thank you for it. I pray, God, now that you give every man and woman the courage to obey you. And whatever it is that you're calling us to do, that we would do that one thing, Lord. And Father, I thank you, God. We don't despise, despise small beginnings. We believe, Lord, that you're guiding us into the future and you're going to prepare a way for us, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. As the musicians, if you'd be kind enough to come and just lead us in worship for a little while. The Holy Spirit speaking to you as we stand. You can come to this altar. You can kneel where you are.